live from the Jacobs Science Building on the University of Kentucky's campus. This building, opened in fall 2016, is the heart of science education at the University of Kentucky. We're excited to answer your questions tonight. First, let me just introduce the panel. We're excited to answer your questions tonight. To my right is Dr. Jennifer Osterhag, the Director of Undergraduate Studies in Biology. To her right is Whitney Barber, a University of Kentucky student majoring in neuroscience and biology. And to my left is Dr. Art Kammers, uh, Director of Undergraduate Studies from Chemistry. To his left is Dr. Robin Cooper, the Director of Undergraduate Studies from Neuroscience. And then on the end is Mrs. Phyllis Nally, who is our pre-med, pre-professional advisor. My name is Jesse Hedge. I'm the Assistant Dean for Undergraduate and International Affairs in the College of Arts and Sciences, and I'll be moderating this evening. First, let me go over some of the ground rules that we have tonight. Uh, tonight's panel is here to answer your questions about science majors at the University of Kentucky. We have uh, admissions staff and residence life staff in the, in the background. They will answer those types of questions, so feel free to bring them. But the panel tonight, um, we're here to answer questions about natural sciences at the University of Kentucky, as well as pre-med uh, and pre-professional questions. Um, we're scheduled to go for about an hour tonight, but we'll go until all the questions have been answered. Looks like we uh, already have a question. Uh, this is probably, this would be best for you, Whitney. So uh, first question is, why did you choose UK and how did you decide on a major? Uh, so I'm from Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky. So when I was choosing the college, I knew I wanted somewhere kind of close to home, but uh, far enough away that I thought I could get a sense of being what an adult was like and being really independent. And then I knew I wanted to do science, so I started looking more towards Central Kentucky, where Lexington and UK are, and the opportunities for research and like what I could do with the rest of my life here are endless. And there was once I saw UK and learned more, it's like there was no other choice. It was here and nowhere. So it was, it was the perfect fit for me, and I hope it will be for you all too. Uh, as far as how I decided my major, uh, I came at it a little weird. I started out as uh, chemistry. I knew I always wanted to do medicine and science. But um, I got here and it was fun, but it, like, it wasn't my passion. Um, so I had Dr. O next to me in class my, so, um, my second semester, freshman year, and that sold me on bio. I was dead. Uh, it was amazing and incredible, and I'm still here uh, with it. And then within bio, I learned a lot about neuroscience, and I couldn't choose between the two. I love them equally. So I was like, you know what? Why not both? I'll just do both. So that's how I'm here now. All right, um, let's see, the next question coming in here. Oh, this is a good one. Um, let's see if we can get, uh, probably Phyllis, you can probably answer this one, and then maybe uh, the rest of you can weigh in as well. And that is, uh, does UK offer study abroad programs for pre-med students? Yeah. Um, UK does offer study abroad opportunities really for any student, but there are opportunities specifically for students who are interested in learning about healthcare in other countries, uh, students who are interested in learning about um, research as it relates to pre-professional paths as well uh, for healthcare in particular. Um, really any opportunity, uh, it just depends on what your takeaway, what you want your takeaway to be. So if you're interested in a, more of a mission related study abroad opportunity, there's that as well. I've had students uh, study abroad in Honduras, Costa Rica, um, and they'll go to a country and help set up a medical mobile clinic for example. Um, if you're interested in a shadowing program abroad, there are opportunities such as that as well. So it really just depends on what you want to hang your hat on and what you want your takeaway to be. The great thing is the Education Abroad Office does have peer mentors who are very well educated about all of these programs and they can meet with you on a drop-in basis. Your pre-professional advisors can meet with you as well and we can share information with you depending on what you want your opportunity to be and how you want to craft that. All right. Yeah, so study abroad, as you said, it's for all majors. Um, and there are a lot of majors that are conducive to pre-professional programs, such as pre-medicine, et cetera. Um, you can do it by the paint-by-numbers game, as in there are programs at the study abroad office that um, chemistry students or biology students can go into, and these are pre-packaged. Or you can um, maybe have a friend or a family member in a, in a foreign country 
um, at an institution that does not have a, a deal mm -hmm. with the University of Kentucky. And you can um, find classes that you think will substitute in your program. Talk to the director of undergraduate studies in your major and in outside your major. Um, and we'll just equate those courses and write them into your major and it'll be just as if you haven't left. Mm -hmm. So you, University of Kentucky, um, really encourages students to study abroad. And I think the advisor can also be really helpful in that process as far as kind of fine tuning things for you. Oftentimes with study abroad, it's difficult to know when should I study abroad, especially if you're a pre-med student. Um, you'll want to make sure that you're still giving yourself ample time to complete the required courses, studying for the MCAT, et cetera. And I think the advisor uh, does an excellent job of helping students identify is spring the best time, fall the best time, summer, and what year, which year should I study abroad as well. Yeah. And we just had some really good example of a study abroad case with a neuroscience student. She studied in Copenhagen this last semester, took two neuroscience courses, and then she found a research mentor to also work with. So she was actually taking three courses while living in Copenhagen. She came back and all those courses transferred in. And she got some research credit and she made some really lifelong friends. So studying abroad is fantastic because you'll really make new friends and learn about different cultures. But she just loved it as a, you know, taking these extra courses. Some students in the past have taken a course in Salamanca, Spain, and then at the same time, usually these study abroad courses will have multiple courses at the same time that you can take. So she took her Spanish courses, and then she took a sensory neuroscience course together. So you can really, you know, get all the courses you want and then transfer it back, and then that way you don't lose a semester and you have a full curriculum. Of great opportunities. You just got to seek out, you know, talk to people and seek those out. One of our um, biology, chemistry double majors, oh, yeah. um, summer before last, um, went to England and spent the summer on Brighton Beach. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> he came back tanned <laughs> and psyched. <laughs> That's like, great. Dammers, man, I had an awesome time. <laughs> it was so awesome. So, you know, uh, it's the thing to do, it really is. Maybe mentors need to go with them. <laughs> <laughs> or at least pop in. Right? Yes, yes. Yeah, we've got to check on it. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a question coming in uh, about are there scholarships for studying abroad? You know, I tell students all the time that uh, part of their uh, student fees that they pay every semester here go to a uh, study abroad type fund. And so those scholarships are available. So I always tell students, you're paying in, you might as well uh, apply for those scholarships and, and uh, many, many students that go abroad do get scholarships. And I'd like to add something to that as well. Um, if you're studying abroad during a fall or spring semester, whatever financial aid that you receive at the University of Kentucky will also apply toward your study abroad tuition. So the tuition is going to be the same whether you're doing it at UK or during your abroad experience. And your, app, your financial aid will apply toward that. But there are scholarships that you can apply for. The Education Abroad Office does a very good job. They just increase those. And if you're a Pell eligible student, it's my understanding now that if you, qual uh, if you apply and you're accepted, you can receive, a, I believe it's a $2,000 scholarship for study abroad. Mm -hmm. so. I studied abroad, and I was only out probably $200. I know mm -hmm. in the summer, so my regular financial aid um, was being used for school. But yeah, it was super affordable. It was amazing. Like, you have to go. Um, and if you're looking for vacation spots, Ecuador was beautiful. Always recommend. The capital, Quito, is absolutely breathtaking. And I don't know. You have to go. That's, that's all I can say. <laughs> yeah. It's like a plane ticket. To be honest, <laughs> most of that was like gifts I brought back because I was <laughs> over with everything. <laughs> so, like, you can have this and this because I bought everything. Nice. nice. Yeah, yeah, super affordable. All right, let's, oh, yep. <laughs> so let's move on from study abroad okay. there. Yeah. So uh, this was another question for you, Whitney. Why did you choose to do a double major, and how does that compare to your friends that only have one major? Uh, anybody watching this is probably interested in science, so you'll get what I mean when, when you really like something, you can't choose between them. And I love different aspects of biology and different aspects of neuroscience. So there, there was never a point where I was like, oh, I love more one one. More one, oh my god, I can't speak. <laughs> I don't, okay, I love them both equally, is essentially what I'm trying to say. I can't choose between them, so I didn't want to put myself in the position of what ifs 20 years later of, oh, well, what if I you know, decided to?
to go the route with the extra major. Um, so it's worth it. If, if you really enjoy something, then go for it. And I did, and I don't regret any of it. Um, as far as my friends who have one major, um, I'm not going to lie, you're really busy. I'm a really busy person. Um, you have extra classes you have to take. Uh, the benefit of generally when you're a science major and you have different interests in science is that they really um, go together really well. So my bio and neuro classes um, really kind of, the best way to say it, they complement each other really well. Um, so sometimes one class will work for both majors. Um, and in my case, a lot of my electives um, for biology could be taken out of my neuro classes. So it's definitely more work, definitely more classes, but it's so worth it in the end to be able to say that I got to pursue both of my passions and I didn't have to cheat. Always, always do both if you really love something that much. Don't, don't make yourself cheat. Yeah. Right, I think this next question will start with you, Dr. Austeri. Um, what are the top choice uh, graduate schools and medical schools that UK alums attend? Oh, that's a good question. Um, a, a lot of our students choose to go to UK for medical school, um, and that's, so that's a very popular choice. Um, I have, I'm working with a student now who's, who's going on, he just got accepted to MD PhD programs. He's thinking about doing his um, MD here in the States and then his PhD in England. So really students are, are everywhere. Um, but UK and, and in-state colleges and universities for, for medical school specifically, I'd say is probably the top choice, but really students have gone just everywhere. I have another student in, in medical school right now in England, um, another student at Vanderbilt. So really, so really students can go wherever they'd like to go. Does anybody have anything they want to add to that? Yeah, I think that, um, a degree from the University of Kentucky as an undergrad will open doors for you all over the country and really all over the world. It just depends on what you want to pursue. At some point, um, for example, with chemistry, um, you're looking at not the school, but your passion. So looking at perhaps somebody who is doing something that you want to do and you would go there for graduate school, communicate with them directly talking with your advisor and just um, paving the way for your future. Really. I think it's like Whitney was just saying too, if you had a major like biology or neuroscience and there's something that you really liked and maybe you've taken a few neuroscience courses in like neurochemistry for example with Alan Butterfield and took some research, but you didn't have the double major and then you wanted to you know go on with graduate school, that Going into the graduate program, the master's or the PhD program in chemistry, for example, gives you that option as well. And we do have some students, University of Kentucky is so large that it's like going to another campus. It's actually like, you know, if you're in biology or chemistry and then you wanted to go to graduate school in the medical school and take pharmacology, for example, it's like going to another university nearly. So it's such a big university that you have a lot of options for graduate school if you wanted to stay here. I think that's really nice compared to some of the smaller schools where you don't have those options for graduate programs. I'd like to kind of, kind of follow up on that as well when you're talking about options. Uh, one of the things that the university uh, does, College of Medicine, uh, that I think is great is that we have expanded our program. So if you're a Kentucky resident, for example, and you're from a rural part of the state, um, you could not only you know, look at staying here in Lexington to complete your um, education degree or medicine degree, but you could look at Northern Kentucky or Moorhead or Bowling Green. Um, you know, we have a great need for f physicians in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, and so this was the university's way of filling that need and encouraging students to re return to their um, part of the state that they're from and, and maybe serve their community after they graduate from med school. So that's a great option to have available you know, to Absolutely. you as well. Excellent. All right, looks like we have another biology question. Um, so what will my, my schedule look like as a biology major? Um, well, first off, we make sure that your schedule is tailored to you and, and where you are in your um, in your preparation. So we use ACT scores or SAT scores or placement tests just to make sure that you're in the right courses that are a good fit for you. But let's say that you come in and you're ready to take Calculus 1. Um, that would indicate to us that you would be in Calculus. You'd also be in Intro Bio 1 um, in the lab that goes along with uh, Intro Bio 1. You'd be in Chemistry 1 uh, in the lab that goes with 
uh, the chemistry course as well. And then you'd probably also take a introductory writing course as well, um, or maybe some students would choose foreign language. So that would be what kind of a typical first semester freshman schedule would look like. And then kind of continuing your second semester, intro bio two, intro chemistry two, mm -hmm. maybe another math course, uh, another writing course, foreign language course. Um, that's kind of what a typical first year looks like. But you get in the labs um, doing science right away um, in the first year at UK, which I think is um, not true at every, every university. So we like to get students in the lab doing real science right away. I'd like to weigh in on that. If, if you're wondering about what any program looks like, you can go to our four-year plans. In, um, so if you Google ANS, um, University of Kentucky, four-year plan, you'll see four-year plans for a lot of different majors. So you, you can find out what it's like to be a biology major, but also chemistry, neuroscience, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So we've got all that laid out for you. And, and we'll put the links to those uh, four-year plans up here before this is over. All right, so Dr. Cooper, uh, questions for you is, how hard is it to conduct research in neuroscience? Well, it's not too hard in the sense of you got to find a mentor, first of all. So we do take in, uh, we really do try to encourage students, even in their first year, to begin to engage in research, like through the STEM CATS program, for example. But we, we advise students to, if they're interested in research, to start to look out mentors early in their first year and email them, get to know those uh, researchers, look at their web pages, right, and then see what kind of research opportunities they have. What's really nice about the neuroscience program, it's an interdepartmental program. So you have people in the neuroscience major taking courses or research credit in chemistry, for example, or in psychology, or in, even in entomology that are interested in a course in bee brains and how bees function, for example. And then all the med medical school departments, pharmacology, uh, neuroscience, immunology, microbiology, biochemistry, all of those different departments have a neuroscience researcher in those departments. So you can actually take research in a variety of different departments in different colleges, and that will transfer into your neuroscience major. So you have a, a wide range of faculty and different research um, opportunities that you might like to get involved in. So I think that really increases the opportunity um, for the students in the neuroscience to explore outside um, programs that they might not be so familiar with, and then get credit for those courses to count. Um, even behavioral ecology, for example, you might be interested in how animals behave, or you might be more interested in cell and molecular biology of how neurons function. So you have field courses, you have lab bench courses, or research experiences, if you like. So basically, I think it's not so difficult to get into a lab. You just need to keep emailing the, the faculty member, talk to them, and what was really nice the other day, a student came and said, I don't have time to do research this semester, but can I just come into your lab and look what the other students are doing and kind of get a feeling of your lab? And I said, sure, we'll just pair you up with somebody, you know, the times that you have, and that way they didn't have to sign up for research right away, but they got a little flavor of it, and that's really nice because it's like shadowing in different labs. And I think that's something we could kind of push more and more before a student makes that commitment. I need, you know, we're going to work in that lab for that whole semester, is they meet other students and they find out what is it like to work in that lab. And I think a really good opportunity for research opportunities is to look at the end of the semester, especially uh, in the spring semester in April, we have a research presentation. I think it's, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's like almost a thousand kids <laughs> nearly, where they're uh, presenting their research at the UK uh, Kentucky Showcase, Undergraduate Showcase of Scholars. So students all across campus in engineering to chemistry to neuroscience to biology, they're presenting their posters of the research opportunities that they had during that semester. And then you can go and talk to those different students and say, what was it like to work in that lab or that lab? And then you get feedback from your own colleagues um, because we're always biased that our labs are the best, of course, right? But uh, your colleagues are really helpful. And you have undergraduate um, organizations like the NeuroCats, uh, biology has TriBeta, chemistry has, um, what do you call it? Uh, ChemCats, right. And so you can actually 
talk with your own colleagues and find out their experiences in the different labs. And I think it really helps the students to begin to understand what it's like. So it's not that hard. You just got to take a little initiative. So you mentioned STEM cats. Mm -hmm. uh, how, do, how do students get paired up with their mentors in STEM cats? Well, usually the mentors will offer, it, it varies. Um, we're asked to if we would like to have a course for STEM cats and then different faculty say this semester, okay, I'll do a STEM cat section. And then students usually give a theme, like a thematic topic for that. This, for example, one time we had one in synaptic transmission. So the students are gonna talk or maybe do some research in synaptic transmission. Another one was actually on some outreaching activities. And so the students see that theme and then they sign up for that. And so it varies, it's not always the same. It's very mixed. doing honey, right? Bees and honey. And they're working on a research program on um, the honey and different kinds of chemicals that are in honey. So the undergraduates are working on that. They're analyzing the honey, looking at different- to why apiaries collapse. And apiaries collapse right. too. So really quite neat uh, topics. You know? From a, a practical standpoint, it might be helpful for a student to know that if you're in the STEM CATS program, during your first semester, you take Bio 101, mm -hmm. and that's a class, and they introduce you to uh, different areas of research. They have different guest speakers who come in, and so that's where you're really initially introduced to the opportunities for research. And as a follow-up, and they also address you know, pre-med and pre-health topics as well, mm -hmm. and then as a follow-up to that in the spring semester, that's where you actually do your research and participate in one of these projects, like um, what Dr. Cooper is talking about. So cool. they really do set you up right away. It's, it's been fun. Some of those STEM cat kids, like their first year, now they're working in the lab um, since I taught it a couple years back. And now they've been two years out of the program, but now they're undergraduate researchers in the lab. So you get to make friends with them, and they then figure out if they like that lab or not. So it's been really fun. I guess we should take a couple minutes to explain exactly what STEM cats is. So STEM cats <laughs> is a living learning program uh, on campus, and it's an opportunity where the students live together, uh, they, they study together, uh, and then they're all part of this, this program. They take the Bio 101 class together, and then in the spring they'll do, uh, do the research. There'll be different sections in the research. Um, but uh, the way a student does that is, uh, is you can sign up for, for STEM CATS when you apply for housing. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, you can learn more about STEM CATS by going to stemcats.as.uky.edu. And now that fills up on a first come, first serve basis. So, um, you know, we encourage you to apply, to apply early. The early uh, action deadline is February 15th. In a living learning program? Yeah, I was. Um, I was in STEM CATS, but I have a lot of friends that were, so I've kind of gotten to see it from the outside through them. Um, you can't go wrong with joining an LLP. I, my current roommates I met, um, through my LLP, we all lived in the same dorm, we took classes together, uh, so I was the only kid in my class that like, came here, didn't know anyone, and then your LLP is a really great resource of helping you figure out the campus, figuring out who you're going to be in college, who you're going to be in life, and then helping you kind of find your little home on campus, truly make campus your home away from home, and I don't know, you're, it's really hard to kind of do that by yourself if you don't have all of these extra resources. It's possible, it's just, it's easier if you already have that stepping stone. So, being an LLP, even if it's not STEM cats, if it's any of the other numerous ones, if you're really interested in social justice or International Village or any of those, join them. But it's going to give you so many resources and connect you with so many people, faculty, um, random staff, just friends in general that you're going to keep in touch with forever. And it's, it's amazing. All right. Next question is for Dr. Cammers. So. What do chemistry majors do, and where do they go after they graduate? <laughs> <laughs> chemistry majors do a lot. There is a, a lot of industry is based on chemistry. Um, where do our majors go? Um, let's just chunk it down into like four rough groups. Um, so the first group, maybe a bit more than a quarter, they're going to be pre-professionals and end up in medical school. Um, pre-dentistry, et cetera. Chemistry is a good foundation for that. 
um, you might be able to tackle um, a um, gas partition problem um, when you're dealing with um, oxygen and partial pressure of CO2 and the workings of the lung, for example. So chemistry is a good um, basis for, for medicine. Um, another group at approximately a quarter, let's say, um, they go off to graduate school in chemistry or biochemistry. Um, so all of our three Bachelor of Science majors prepare our students for um, graduate school. They're all rigorous enough for our students to go right into graduate school from, from um, an undergraduate program. And in chemistry, we don't do masters. We, do, we go from the undergraduate um, Bachelor of Science, usually, to the um, PhD programs. And um, likely, your progress through the PhD is going to be funded. Um, your advisor is going to have funding, and basically, you'll be giving up the advantage you might have by working. Um, you won't be paid as much, but you're not going to be totally getting poor either. So um, you're going to have a PhD. It'll be an opportunity for you to forward your career and extend your adolescence and have more fun <laughs> as, as well. Um, another maybe quarter, um, get jobs directly out of the undergraduate experience. There's a lot to do as a chemist. Um, if you are interested in careers that chemists um, have, um, go to the American Chemical Society careers. That's pretty much all you have to Google and you'll have a, a lot of information about um, what chemists do and where you, what you can do with your undergraduate degree. Um, and maybe a little less than a quarter of our majors um, become pharmacists. Here at the University of Kentucky, you don't have to carry a bachelor's degree to enter into the pharmacy program. So they quit after their third year um, if the College of Pharmacy accepts them and they're gone. We don't see them as lost causes. We don't see them <laughs> as, um, we, we, we take them umbrage. We, we, we've gotten them to the point where they can use their, their education. Um, it's worth something to them. They've accrued enough cultural capital to take that next step and we applaud them. So that's basically where our chemistry um, students go, but um, there are other small fractions here and there that um, always amaze me, and mm -hmm. those, those guys are doing well too, but um, hard to characterize. Maybe Arthur doesn't remember, but I was a chemistry major as an undergraduate. <laughs> so, you were older than I. No, so, oh, I'll get it. <laughs> you no, I wasn't here at UK, <laughs> but, but see, a chemistry yeah, major could go, yeah, yeah, I had lots of fun. That's and awesome. it, it directed me into neuroscience later on, so Yay. it was really good. Awesome. Yeah, very good. All right. Next one's for Dr. Osterhag. Um, would you recommend using AP credits to opt out of freshman level science classes? Or would you recommend taking other classes to strengthen the foundation in the sciences? That's a really good question, and I get that question a lot. So um, you, you can, if you have a four or five on the AP exam in biology, you can um, test out of the first year of the intro bio courses. You cannot skip the lab, though, so everyone will, um, will need to take the lab. And it just depends on that, that experience and how good that experience was in high school, whether I would actually recommend you, you going straight to our next level, which is the 300 level genetics course, or maybe taking one of the intro bio courses just to make sure you've got a strong foundation and you really understand what college level courses are like. Um, it is different. College level biology is definitely different than AP. Um, in AP, you're, you're getting a lot of information across a big range of biology concepts. In intro bio, we're really going to go in depth in those concepts and really set the foundation for our 300 level coursework. So um, that, that choice is up to you. Um, if it was me, if I, if I had to go back and do it again, I would do AP courses in things that maybe would fulfill UK core and wasn't the foundation of my entire major. So um, I was a bio major actually here at UK and Dr. Cooper was my advisor and, and professor. Um, and I came in without any AP biology and I was happy to have that strong foundation in introductory biology before I moved on. 
Um, but let's say you have AP um, history and you can test out of a UK core in history that you might want to do that so you don't have to think about the, that course when you're here and you can really focus on your science courses. Maybe Phyllis would have some additional thoughts there. Um, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. And it is a tough question and mm -hmm. we, we receive that question all the time from students. If you're on a pre-professional path, um, I think you should really consider, you know, going ahead and taking those sciences. And I completely agree. You know, maybe do the AP credits and other things that are a little more benign. Uh, keeping in mind that you're going to be taking per, uh, an admissions prep or an admissions exam for your program. For example, for med school, you're going to be taking the MCAT, dental school, the DAT, optometry school, the OAT, and so on. And these um, introductory level biology and chemistry courses are really going to be instrumental in making sure that you're prepared uh, mm -hmm. for those exams because they're very content uh, heavy, the exams are. And so having that, I think, in your background, um, close to the time that you're taking those exams will definitely be useful mm -hmm. and helpful to you. Okay, uh, probably either one of you could answer this, this next one. It's, uh, do, do AP scores allow you to advance beyond introductory level English course um, if the major is biology? Um, <clears throat> it, what the AP exam does, it depends on your score and it depends on the type of AP exam you take for English in particular. Um, if you take the AP Lang exam, I believe, and you score a four or higher, then you, that allows you to advance to our advanced level English. Mm -hmm. So you're essentially um, remove, uh, you're, uh, you only have to take one English course instead of two. So you would take our WRD or CIS 112 class instead of taking the one level and the two level. So it does allow you to advance, um, which is nice because it reduces the number of classes that you have to take. You can also, uh, if you score high enough on the sub-score for the, uh, the sub-test for the uh, English section of the ACT or the SAT, you can also advance uh, mm -hmm. to the higher level English class as well. And I believe you need a 32 on the ACT uh, uh, English subsection to be able to advance. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I'll throw this out there and uh, Whoever wants to jump in with the answer here, uh, this should be a good one. I want to go to medical school, but I'm undecided on my major. What are my options? The world is your oyster. <laughs> <laughs> Biology. <Truly>. No. <laughs> yes. Neuroscience. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you can major in anything, it's true, and apply to medical school, dental school, any professional program that you're interested in, as long as you take the appropriate pre-professional courses along the way, and as long as you, of course, take the appropriate entrance exam and you have a nicely well-rounded application. So that is true. However, let me add this caveat. It is really, really critical that you make sure that you're prepared for that next step. So if you're going to choose to major in something that's not a na natural science, then I would highly encourage you to take some upper-level biology courses, for example, upper-level chemistry courses, mm -hmm. not only to help you prepare for the entrance exams, but also to help you prepare for that next level. It's not enough just to get into med school. You want to stay in med school and you want to do well, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why we encourage you to make sure that you are prepared. And don't fool yourself into thinking, um, I want to take the easy path because these programs are not easy. They are challenging, they are rigorous, and we want you to be prepared. So biology perfectly aligns uh, with the pre-med path. Neuroscience does as well. Chemistry uh, also is not very nicely aligned for the, for the pre-med path. We have a biological chemistry. Yes, mm -hmm. biochem. And I call that the Mac Daddy major <laughs> because it has everything. It has biology, chemistry, mathematics, physics, and uh, it is a rigorous path, but a great major. Mm -hmm. All right, so this next one could be for Dr. Cammers. Uh, can you describe the lab classes that go along with uh, chemistry and then what are those classes like? Um, well, once you get past the Gen Chem course, um, you've got lab, well, we've got lab courses for gen chemistry, general chemistry, and once you get past that, um, we've got the organic lab courses. Um, in general chemistry, you are doing general chemistry lab, which is descriptive inorganic chemistry. Um, they're beginning lab courses. Um, we focus on safety. You're learning about how to um, 
handle quantities and stoichiometry, etc. Um, the next sequence is the organic sequence, and that's your sophomore year. Um, you're doing laboratory with organic molecules. These are mostly carbon-based molecules. We're doing chromatography um, and spectroscopy, um, infrared spectroscopy, um, NMR spectroscopy. Um, but chemistry has sub-disciplines, and we want to really get you hands-on experience in those sub-disciplines, and the laboratory is the way to do that. So in advanced inorganic chemistry, for example, you're making um, some really technical inorganic compounds that have really cool um, interactions with light. Um, and we have the physical chemistry laboratory that um, basically has a lot of different instrumentation. You can go into that lab and um, it's just amazing. Chemistry is basically a hands-on major and we feel we need to get you prepared by um, a lot of rich experiential, experiential um, classes. Um, so what is a laboratory like? It's almost like trying to explain blue to somebody <laughs> who can't see light. <laughs> um, it's an experience, right? And um, we've got, you've got problems to solve. Um, You've got um, what's in it, how much is there, how pure it is, um, and a lot of what we know in chemistry is what we can find out by shining electromagnetic radiation on something and having that information come back to us in the form of a spectrum. This is how we know um, what the stars are doing, right? With the chemistry of the stars and, and even how we're going to discover um, if there's life on other planets, mm -hmm. by looking at the light that's coming off of those other planets when we can get more observational um, data from them. So chemistry is doing and inquiring about what you've done by analysis and um, writing some kind of a, a report um, about it. About a third of the credit in a chemistry major is laboratory. We have this really, really, really cool laboratory that's called the Fabrication Laboratory mm -hmm. in which we're actually building small devices. If you're interested in how your cell phone works, for example, this is the lab for you. Um, you we can make devices by laying thin layers of material and building them up um, from the ground up and then doing um, analysis to see if they do what we want um, in terms of um, input and output. Mm -hmm. I hope I answered your question a little bit, but mm -hmm. the, the real answer is it's an experience and it's hard to encapsulate in a few paragraphs. Mm -hmm. Thanks. In biology, we really want students to think like a scientist, so we introduce students to the way scientists approach problems and think about problems, so we might give, a student, give students some sort of problem, they might work together to form a hypothesis um, about that and then test that hypothesis in the lab. So, so in biology, it's really about um, thinking critically and thinking through problems like scientists do. And it's so neat, like um, in biology class this semester, we're teaching animal physiology. And when a student was, you know, looking at membrane potentials across a cell and they said they were adding different chemicals and getting this nice curve, and they said, boy, that looks just like my textbook. Mm -hmm. And you think, wow, they got it. You know? <laughs> and that yeah. they could do it themselves. So I think these lab experiences are, I think they're better than lectures, actually, because you really have a hands-on learning. And, and you're generating the data and basically what you see in your textbook. You have a much better understanding of the concepts. But it's so nice to hear the students, well, I can get that same kind of graph or figure. So it's really good. So these labs are a wonderful opportunity. Now, I love the fact that just a little bit ago you talked about us being a large university. Mm -hmm. And then and then just now you talked about hands-on experience. Exactly. Right? And yeah. so I think uh, that's something that a lot of times we miss out on. It's, uh, you know, some students think we're too big, um, but the, we're big enough that students get the opportunities for all these experiences, and we're small enough that they can be in your lab yeah. or your lab, or they can 
do these experiments and not have to worry um, about just being a number. And I think that's a great point. When we take students that visit the campus, and you're always welcome to come and visit, we have you know days that you can show you around campus. For example, the physiology class that we have right now in Bio 350, it's a, mostly juniors and seniors, but we have seven sections of that class. And we have sections that would just meet Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and another group of lectures on Tuesday, Thursday. So mix your schedule. But not only that, we have seven different lab times. So we have setups. The university spent a lot of money for the, like, the physiology setups. But we only have two students per setup. So you really get a lot of hands-on. You know, you have to be working together. And some of those labs, I mean, they're three-hour labs, but they might be going on a Wednesday, 9 to 12, 12 to 3, 3 to 6, and last year went 6 to 9, you know. But the idea is to have so many labs um, for the kids to make it like a small university in that sense that all the students get a hands-on experience. And when you think about that kind of equipment, you know, a large university can buy this kind of equipment where smaller universities really can't afford that. If you look at our animal physiology, our neurophysiology lab, I think there's like a half a million dollars in each one of those labs and equipment. And then you think about the imaging course that we offer in biology now with confocal imaging. A small university can't afford a half a million dollar microscope, but we offer an imaging course for these students to learn the state of the art um, techniques. And I think it's the same with chemistry. You look at these chemistry labs, it's phenomenal the equipment that you have in there and kids are really getting a hands-on, you know, experience. So you, you mentioned physiology. What is a student doing in physiology laboratory? Oh, in physiology lab physiology. <laughs> <laughs> physiology, the definition is by Wrong, you know, right? yeah, how we <laughs> function. Exactly. You've got to and wrestle with it that, almost. It's chemistry. We actually worked with the Nertz equation this week. Oh nice. And, yes. And they, you know, measure their membrane potential by the determining the concentration gradient across that membrane. So when the Faraday constant. Yes. And they're actually using Faraday cages that are, you know, take away the electrical noise of the room. So nice. they have to learn, you know, volt volt volte and galvanic current and Faraday cages. So biology, chemistry, physics, they all go together. You can't separate them out. And that's why I really think it's great to have the STEM major because you continue to Use your chemistry, use your physics. I tell them, don't purge your math. You know, <laughs> use your math too. <laughs> <Don't purge> your <laughs> math. <laughs> uh, it all comes together. <laughs> you know, I'm glad you just mentioned a few other majors there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, today we, all, we only have these three uh, departments here, but, uh, but we all also answer questions about physics and we'll yeah, answer questions about. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, we have mathematics, we have mathematical economics, we have geological sciences, we have mm -hmm. physics. All of those things uh, are available at the university, and, uh, and we'll certainly answer those questions tonight to the best of our ability. And if we can't answer them directly tonight, uh, then we'll get back to you on those, uh, on those uh, questions. So please feel free to ask those questions as well. All right, that's a good question here for you, Dr. Alshay. I'm ready. All right. I've been admitted to several universities. Why should I choose biology at UK? Oh, well, I will teach you. How about that? Uh, I think. We do a great job in a, in a couple respects. You've heard about the research. I think getting students involved in research right away, their very first year, is something that you're not going to find at a lot of universities. And you'll, you'll see at UK that um, if you're in STEM CADs, and even if you're not in STEM CADs, you can have those research opportunities your very first year. And we also encourage students to do research um, their junior and senior, and sometimes even their sophomore years as well, and have that credit count towards the major. And because we're a large university, there are so many options. So let's say you are interested in cancer biology, and there's no one in the biology department maybe that you want to work with, but there is someone in the College of Medicine you can actually work with faculty in the College of Medicine. Um, so getting involved in research, either in biology or in a, a different college with a mentor, I think UK does a really good job of that. Um, another thing that we, we, I think, do really well is that we've got some great faculty members to teach you. Um, at the intro level, we've, we have PhD scientists teaching you. You're not taught by a TA in the classroom. You're taught by a PhD scientist. And um, I'm one of those. I teach in the intro level. We also have backgrounds in education. So um, we're not just standing up there talking to you for an hour and 15 minutes. We're doing interactive stuff. The lecture, the class is recorded, so you can go back and look later. Students are um, 
I'm asking questions in class and students are putting in their answers on an app on their phone and I'm getting the results in class and talking about it right there in real time. Um, so that first year experience, you're getting taught by really some experts both in science and education. And then as you move on into your upper level classes, you can be taught by these world-renowned scientists in different fields. So you can be taught by Dr. Cooper in physiology, you can be taught um, by learn genomics by some uh, people who are just published in science for publishing the uh, genomes of axolotls. So you can, we've got this range of faculty that, that um, to me is uh, a real benefit of coming here. Um, do you have anything to add? Uh, on the faculty, yes. <laughs> Two of you have been, I had physiology with Dr. Cooper, I had you for intro bio. Um, there's there's something about the faculty here, especially in the bio department, and like all across the board, but I have the most experience there. I have never walked out of a class and been like, why am I here or why are they teaching me? I remember like little bits and pieces from each of my professors' research because they're, they're so excited about their fields. They genuinely care about how you're doing, what you're doing, and what you're learning. And that level of excitement makes your classes so much more enjoyable. It makes you want to get to know your professors as a person, uh, it makes you want to get to know the field outside of an academic area, and that's that's something that's kind of hard to get anywhere else that I feel like. Um, like Dr. O said, we have world-renowned professors, and they're all so unique and amazing in their own ways that going anywhere else, you'd miss out on that, and you, you really can't. The bio department here is amazing, and it's hard to put into words, but I wouldn't speak about it if I didn't love it, and I wouldn't be here if I didn't love it. So you asked why UK, but like, why not UK? UK is great. We're all here for it. And I came back here after being an undergrad, <laughs> so I, I really love it. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't have come back if I didn't think it was a great place for, for, um, for students and for faculty. And we just really, really want students to succeed. And I think that comes out in our classes. All right, we're sticking with the biology questions here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what are some interesting careers you can do with a degree in biology? Oh, you can do a lot with a degree in biology. So. Um, like Dr. Cameras, we kind of have different groups of students. We've got a lot of pre-med, pre-professional students who are going on to um, medical school, dental school, vet school, um, pharmacy school. Um, you can have my job. You can go on for a PhD. <laughs> and actually, I do have the job of my intro bio professor. So you never know. You could be sitting in my classroom and 20 years later be teaching it. Um, that was my path. Um, so you can go for a PhD and, and go um, into science, there's obviously a lot of industry um, and a lot of, a lot of biopharmaceutical companies and drug development companies that you can work for. Um, I have a friend who was a biology major here who now does forensics for the state of Kentucky, so you can work for um, the government and do uh, science type analysis there, either environmental or molecular, doing crime scene type um, analysis. So. Really, there's a huge range. You can work in um, uh, sustainability, ecology, um, work for the government doing those types of studies as well. Um, so there's really a big range you can do with the world. Dr. Cooper, same question. Oh, well, <laughs> same, yeah, same thing. It's like I said before, they all interact together. It just kind of sees where your passion is. For neuroscience, you might be a little bit more specific you know, specific to work on the nervous system, but you learn that content, a cell, a nerve cell, muscle cell, you know, and how they respond to chemicals or um, drugs, pharmacological agents. You learn the basics in your undergraduate, and you can apply that in all different areas. I was a chemistry major as an undergraduate, as I mentioned, and I became really interested in neuroscience and how the neurochemistry was working in the brain, and I, I think that was just fascinating. But some of our students you know, go off to Eli Lilly and work just up in Indianapolis. There's a great pharmaceutical company there for them. The pharmaceutical companies are you know, heavily focused in the nervous system right now for lots of disorders. So the more you understand about the nervous system, the better you'll have a chance to maybe work for a pharmaceutical company. And I think it's something that we um, don't talk about too much, but maybe we should push more often is that the internships that you can actually get with industry while you're an undergraduate you could work in the summer, for example, in these industrial positions and find out, is this something that you're interested in? I did my postdoc in Switzerland in Basel, and there it's the center of Siebegeige, Sandoz, Hoffman LaRoche, the three largest you know, pharmaceutical companies. And I didn't realize it until I was there working, 
so many American students were there in the summer hired by these companies to work in their labs. And it was a two-way street. Those companies were looking at them for future hires, but also those students were looking to see, do I want to work for that company? And so I think this is a great opportunity. It doesn't matter if you're a biology major, neuroscience, or chemistry major. There's wonderful opportunities to get into industry if that's your passion, um, or you know, research labs and see what's happening. So I, it's just there's a wide range of opportunities to go into. I remember as an undergraduate, the FBI was recruiting uh, chemistry majors. This is way before you know CSI was on TV. <laughs> And I thought, boy, that sounds exciting. But then I took a neuroscience course, and that kind of got me into going into graduate school. But um, lots of opportunities. When you think about the import mm -hmm. of neurochemistry, chemistry, and biology, um, and basically other fields of science, to the real challenge that is facing humanity today, which is ecology and the environment, mm -hmm. there's, it's, so much is going to open up. Um, our environment is collapsing, um, we're losing the clouded leopard, Siberian tiger, the white rhinoceros, etc. Um, and your generation, I'm talking to people younger than 53, <laughs> my age, you're going to have to do something about this because it can't go on much longer. It, it's, it's really tear jerking. All right, I guess I'll... I think I can take this next one, actually. This is, uh, what is Fast Track, like, Fast Track Week like for STEM cats, and what does it entail? So Fast Track Week, uh, basically STEM cat students come to campus early. Uh, they move in, uh, I think it's about five days early, not a full week. Uh, and then they will take class, introductory classes. They'll take, depending on their math, where they're placed in math, they'll take some math. Um, they'll take an intro, a little bit of intro to biology. Um, I think they uh, get to experience some lab. Um, and then on top of that, there's a lot of social activities where they'll uh, get together in the evenings and they'll get to know other students, get to know campus. Um, and they'll work with um, our uh, associate dean for advising, uh, Dr. Beattie, uh, and then all the departments will be involved. Um, in the past, we've even had some, uh, some foreign languages in there and some writing courses. And it changes a little bit each year. We, we look at our results each year and then uh, make some changes. But a Fast Track Week is a kind of a combination of social, uh, getting to know campus, and then learning what it's like to take a college class, right? So, so all of you have been in school, you've all taken courses, and you've all taken tests, but you don't know what a college test is like. And so you'll get a chance to do a little of that um, during, during STEM cats, uh, during that fast track week. So. But it won't affect your GPA. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it's a good way to get practice. I teach in the fast track biology, and we really, um, in addition to, to seeing what tests are like, we actually give students free tests over those days. Mm -hmm. That sounds terrible, but we really want students to see what those college tests yeah. are like, so we give them lots of experience, and again, it doesn't matter if you fail those. You now know where your strengths and weaknesses are and what you can focus on next time. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, you also get used to Canvas, which is exactly. the system That's where all of our courses mm -hmm. will be, and you'll get used to the apps that we use in, court, in class to um, record your answer. So by the time that the other students get here, you're gonna, it's going to be old hat to you, um, and you can focus on the more fun stuff and not have to stress when classes start about, you know, what books do I need, what, how do I navigate um, the online courses, uh, and things like that. So it's fun. And a lot of students meet their lifelong friends when they come. I have a lot of students who graduated last year and said, I met my, you know, re future roommates and, and friends at that past track week. All right, we'll go to a pre-med question there for you, Phyllis. Um, would you recommend earning a master's degree before applying to medical school? You know, I think it really depends upon the individual student. Uh, I truly do. The majority of the students who I experience who do decide to do a master's degree first um, maybe feel like their application isn't strong enough initially, and so uh, we meet with them and we talk about other ways, other things that they can do uh, to strengthen their application before they enter. And one of the things that they can do is take master's level work to demonstrate that they can handle a more rigorous uh, course load. Mm -hmm. And so I think in a case like that, uh, it would definitely be recommended. As a rule, I don't see too many students doing that unless they have a pretty good reason for it. And then um, still on the pre-med path, um, mm -hmm. specifically what 
services do we offer uh, within the College of Arts and Sciences and, and at okay. UK in general, but specifically in arts and sciences um, for pre-med students? Okay. Um, I, yeah, I really think that this is one of the things that sets uh, UK apart uh, as a regional university in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Um, again, it all goes back to opportunity and what's available to the student. You do have to be intrinsically motivated. You do have to seek these things out. But if you know the right people to talk to, we can get you there. And um, some of the pre-med services that we offer, shadowing, for example, there is a summer observership program that's offered uh, through the university. Um, uh, and it was a uh, gentleman who started this, and he was in family practice uh, through the College of Medicine. His name escapes me right now. Don but Frazier. It, Don Frazier? No, oh. not, not Don oh, Frazier. Yeah. <laughs> but, but anyway, you can apply for this at the end of your first year once you've had your uh, chemistry and your biology classes. You can do it in the summer here in uh, Lexington or in Louisville if you won't be in the mm -hmm. Lexington area. Um, besides that, uh, there are other opportunities. Um, I think uh, Dr. Osterhag mentioned that we have many faculty in the College of Medicine who uh, you can partner with on research. Well, the same thing goes for shadowing. Um, you know, the majority of the faculty there are physicians or, or they do research in medicine, and I recommend that many of my students reach out to them for those opportunities, and, and they do have had great success uh, with that as well. Um, the Lexington area itself, we have more than 10 hospitals here. Okay. Um, and some of those you know, kind of serve the general population, but some of those are also kind of specialty hospitals like Sh Shriners, for example, if you're interested in working with children. Um, there's also, uh, I think it's uh, Baptist Health that serves a lot of women uh, who are you know, uh, with child delivery, maternity, et cetera. Um, there are also uh, rehab facilities uh, in Lexington if you're interested in PT or anything like that. Um, so there's great, great opportunity at your fingertips here, uh, whether it's on campus or off campus. Um, there are also a number of pre-health clubs. Uh, mm -hmm. There's pre-med activities council. There's FIDE, which is a pre-med fraternity. There's um, pre-dental society, pre-PT club, pre-farm club. Uh, you name it, we have it here uh, at the University of Kentucky. And the great thing about those clubs and organizations is you're going to meet students who have common interests and common goals. And they can share their experiences with you. They can introduce you to others. Uh, there'll be guest speakers who are high-level people who are doing research in their field. And uh, they can help guide and direct you as well. And there is that course, Experiential 396, right? Yes, 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 if you're interested in doing an internship. And there are many internships available. There's one that I can think of immediately that a lot of my pre-med students do, and it's in an anesthesiology specifically. And uh, some of my students have done that in, um, for consecutive semesters. But it does uh, allow you to gain that real life, real world experience. Mm -hmm. And you can earn college credit, but it's EXP 396. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's another opportunity. Within the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, I would also like to add, we have two pre-health professions advisors. Uh, I'm one of those, of course. We do a number of workshops for our students. Uh, we just sure secured a grant, and we're offering a, an interprofessional test prep program for the MCAT, the DAT, the OAT. And faculty from chemistry, from biology, from mathematics, from physics, biochemistry, um, social sciences, all those faculty are participating in helping students get ready for those exams. We do workshops on preparing for your personal statement, your application. Mm -hmm. um, so we do a lot of really wonderful things in arts and sciences. Uh, we also have a listserv that we can add our students to so they can learn about other opportunities outside of arts and sciences. Um, so it's the place to be, we think. So great services. Are there any uh, high school coursework that students can do to help them with getting ready for pre-med? Sure. Um, you know, it would really be very similar to what you would take your first year in undergrad. Uh, we encourage you to take as many high-level you know, chemistry, math, uh, biology, even anatomy and physiology, even though a lot of med schools don't require it because you take it in med school, it's still going to give you a good background. Uh, physics, anything that's going to challenge you, it's going to give you that extra level of rigor, is gonna, only going to prepare you for that next step. Sounds good. And we even have um, a number of pre-veterinarian students here at UK, right? And we do. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we have some that have actually worked in the lab. Mm -hmm. We've really enjoyed these pre-veterinarian students. Um, vet school is very hard to get into. 
a number of them, and this is another opportunity, like you were just saying, there's all these hospitals here, but there's a lot of veterinarian hospitals yes. here too. So we have some pre-med students that are actually vet techs. What a great opportunity to work with a veterinarian doing surgery. Um, and you're not going to be able to do that so much with a human, right? But you get to work with a, a veterinarian and you might be doing that surgery, uh, taking care of broken bones, car accidents. So we've had a number of pre-vet students working in the lab as a researchers, and then they've gone on to uh, veterinarian school. But boy, do they have such a good experience by uh, being a vet tech. I tell the pre-meds, apply for to be a vet tech, you know, because you're going to learn so much about healthcare in general. And you're going to do it probably a lot more than you can on a human. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but those students have been great. So the veterinarian program, pre-veterinarian program, if that's of interest to you as well, um, definitely take the hard you know, path because it'll prepare you well. And then get that experience, like shadowing with a physician, you know, shadowing with a veterinarian. And I, I would add to that, um, uh, Dr. Cooper mentioned shadowing. In addition to the, uh, the science level coursework that you take in high school, do as much shadowing as you can, mm -hmm. especially if you're not sure of what health professions path you're interested in. Maybe you're interested in med school and being a PA. I would highly encourage you to start shadowing as early as you possibly can in both areas to kind of help, you know, eliminate what you don't want to do. How about the shoulder to shoulder programs we have at UK? Yes. Um, so actually did one of those. Oh, you, you did one? Yeah. Yes. Go yeah. Ahead. Thank you. Uh, no worries. Yeah. Um, so I, it's through the Education Abroad Office. Mm -hmm. It's called Shoulder to Shoulder Global. It's an organization. Uh, I went to Santo Domingo, Ecuador. That's mm -hmm. why I mentioned Ecuador earlier. It's beautiful. Um, but my particular brigade, essentially what happens is UK has a medical clinic in uh, Ecuador year round. Uh, and periodically, four times a year, they send a group of professionals uh, from every aspect of healthcare. So not just uh, physicians, but we had PT there, we had a um, psychologist there, uh, nursing was there, dentistry, uh, optometry, every aspect of healthcare, even the ones they didn't mention, were covered. And then we went to different uh, smaller communities in Ecuador, and then we even uh, helped an indigenous population. And we were there to help give them healthcare for a short period, but we were also there to show them where a forever medical home would be because we wanted to leave it better than when we got there. So we mm -hmm. didn't want to be like, hey, here's healthcare for a week, see you in two months. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was really nice that I kind of got to experience just how interdisciplinary healthcare is and see, you know, even though I want to be a physician, I'm going to rely on every single person there to help me do my job and help me um, keep people as healthy as possible for as long as mm -hmm. possible. So being able to see that, but then also being able to experience the fact that once we left, they were still gonna have all of those resources available. It was indescribable. It made me so happy that we're actually giving back in a really su sustainable way. And if you have a chance to come to UK and go on shoulder, uh, one of the Shoulder to Shoulder Global Food Gates, I definitely recommend it. It was an invaluable experience and I got to see things that I don't necessarily think I would get to see here just because we have too many resources, which isn't something I ever thought I would complain about, <laughs> but I'm definitely glad I went to Ecuador. All right, let's go with the one last question and uh, we'll figure out, anybody can jump in on this one. And that is, um, how do I know what classes to sign up for to make sure I graduate in four years? Meet with your advisor. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. As yeah. soon as you register uh, yeah, at you. UK, you'll get, um, well, if you enter the, the arts and sciences, any program in the mm -hmm. arts and sciences college, you get a professional advisor mm -hmm. that is geared towards your major. For example, if you're pre-medicine, <laughs> you might get that. But um, as soon as you are would get um, to be a junior, at least in chemistry, mm -hmm. you get a faculty advisor, and there are five of us. Um, and they will basically guide you through your program. Mm -hmm. We also have um, software that will help you do it as well. So you can follow your own progress through through your major. So we have got a lot of infrastructure to um, help you with this question. I think it's kind of like what you said too. You, you can go into the website and look at those four-year plans mm -hmm. and you basically see all your courses lined up for those four years, right? And now I, I really like that new system that UK started, the UK GPS, because you can put in your plan courses and as an advisor now, you can look at that freshman student and they have all their plan courses. Of course, they might need to change a little bit because maybe the courses are offered at the same time or something, but they can look at their whole plan right away 
I think that's really gives them that freedom and they can move things around. So having that new program that's on campus, um, I think that's totally. great. It really helps. Yeah. Do the students stay with you the whole time um, when they kind of, kind of treat the first question? Yes. Uh, for, I, I advise uh, natural science students based on major, but I'm also the secondary advisor for pre-health professions. And any student in our college who is on that path can email me to set up a meeting. And we do individual meetings year round from year one all the way through year four. And it really is up to the student to determine how, many, how often they would like to meet with us uh, for mm -hmm. the pre-professional path. Um, I would like to also add something regarding the major advising. Um, you're assigned a, a major advisor even before you step on campus, and you can start emailing your advisor immediately. And if you have any concerns about being off track, whether it's in math or something else, those are the kinds of conversations you'll have with your advisor um, so that we can help you get back on track and hopefully ensure that you can graduate in, in four years. Mm -hmm. That's you know, and something that we do that I'm, I'm not aware of anyone else uh, that's doing this, is uh, students that come in, uh, particularly the science majors, um, you'll walk in the door, you'll, you'll pretty much have a full schedule already filled out for you, already ready to go. Now, if the student wants to change, you're, you're allowed to change. We're not telling you you have to do this, these, but th we're giving you recommended courses based mm -hmm. on your incoming characteristics, um, based on a lot of different things uh, to, uh, to allow students uh, to be on track from the beginning. So. Uh, instead of having to figure out every class, you might just have to figure out one or two when you come for your advising. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we've been doing that now, I think, for maybe four mm -hmm. years, yeah, and, uh, and it's really worked out mm -hmm. well. It's really worked out well. We call that um, cohort scheduling. Cohort scheduling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. all right. So it looks like the questions have about wrapped up. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the panel. Thank you all, all so right. much for, for being here today and, and providing such great answers. Um, and I'd also like to thank all of you for tuning in today. Um, we hope that we've answered your questions, but if we haven't, you can always reach us at asrecruiting at uky.edu. Now, um, I'm also going to be going through here. I'm going to give you a lot of websites. Don't worry about writing them down. You can always come back and watch the video, or um, we're going to post all these websites so that you can get to them and see them. Um, but first of all, we'd like to get some feedback about our event tonight. So uh, please go to um, www dot as dot uky dot edu slash science live underscore survey to fill out a survey about tonight's event um, and then uh, there's a couple other things that uh, that I really want to uh, talk about today and that is come to campus if you haven't come to campus um, we really think you should experience uh, our campus and and uh, everybody on the panel here um, meets with students um, often and uh, you can come so if you want to just visit the the university then uh, you can go to uh, www.uky.edu slash admissions slash schedule dash tour to schedule your uh, visit or you can do uh, natural science visit um, by going to uh, students.as.uky.edu schedule slash visit or sorry schedule dash visit um, and now the next part is, uh, is really important if you've already been admitted and you've not confirmed yet what are you waiting for? <laughs> right? I mean, um, we really, it's really important that, that, that you confirm your attendance, um, that, that you uh, decide to see blue and, and, and come with us. And so uh, you can do that um, by going to www.uky.edu slash cblueu slash register. Um, that's how you can confirm your attendance. Um, and then if you haven't applied yet, I'm really asking you what you're waiting for then. Um, but, um, but that's okay. Um, our early action deadline is still, or I'm sorry, our regular action deadline is uh, February 15th, and you can apply on the common application or go on to uh, the UK website to do that. Um, and then finally, we'll, we will be hosting two more uh, YouTube live events on Wednesday, February 6th at 7 o'clock. We'll be hosting a YouTube live for humanities majors, and then on February 7th, um, we'll be hosting a YouTube live for social science majors. Um, you can go to those events. Uh, the humanities one is cblue.com slash humanities live. And the social science one is cblue.com slash social science live. Um, again, thank you so much for being here today. Um, if you have any questions at all for us, uh, we have plenty of websites will be on this page. You can look them up. You can also email us at asrecruiting at uky.edu.